Derek is the head coach of Derek Laudermilk Coaching, scientist and writer, contributing to Training Peaks and his own blog. My name is Kelly Steuben, and I am a program manager over here at Training Peaks. Um, today, during the webinar, if you have any questions, make sure you enter them in the questions box during the webinar. Don't wait to the end to ask questions. That way we can collect the questions and address them at the end. And with that said, I'm going to hand the presentation over to Derek. Derek? Hello. Hi, guys. Can everyone, uh, can everyone hear me all right? If, uh, if you can hear me, just type into the chat box um, that I'm coming through loud and clear. Hopefully, uh, let's see. Derek, you sound great. Loud okay, and clear. Okay, cool. Awesome. Uh, yes, yeah, so today we are going to go into, I called it how to plan your best cyclocross season. This is going to be uh, a whole bunch of great stuff about, you know, the whole gamut of, of everything you need to know for cyclocross season. Um, so, whoops, let me, oh, now you guys can see. Okay, so this is me, Coach Derek Laudermilk, and um, I'll tell you a bit more about myself. Um, thanks for the thanks for the intro, Kelly. Uh, like she mentioned, I'm the founder and head coach of Derek Laudermilk Coaching. I just finished a MS in microbiology, and I'm actually calling you today from Angkor Wat, Cambodia, which. Um, it's halfway around the world, and I'm just really excited to be talking to you guys about cyclocross. Even though I'm over here with my wife, we are on um, on our honeymoon, actually. So, um, and I and I've always wanted to go to Angkor Wat, and I wanted to give this webinar. So, um, if the internet acts funny or anything like that, um, you'll hopefully excuse me because I'm calling you from the, the developing world. <laughs> Um, okay, so we are, um, I'm expecting to go about 60 minutes, so that's what you can expect um, time-wise. And, okay, who is this for? Um, I already sort of described that in the description of the webinar, but this is for first-time racers. This is for racers who are in their first few seasons of cross, and they're looking to take their racing to the next level. Um, and this is for people like masters racers and juniors racers who want to get that competitive edge. Now, I know some of you are thinking, you know, cross is just just a really fun sport, and you know, it's not it's not all about the racing. Um, that's, there's a lot of people out there that just want to go and, you know, they don't necessarily go all in with their training and they just want to go out and get money. Um, and there's people like me who love racing and, you know, I can't get enough of, of racing. And so this is going to be mostly about the racing side of cross and how to think about planning and getting going for a really good racing season. So real quick before we get started, um, you know, just uh, I think Kelly already went over some of the housekeeping um, things, but get to a get to a quiet space and uh, you know turn your phone off, maximize the webinar window so you can see everything that's going on. If you want to get out a pen and paper and take notes, that would be awesome because hopefully I'll be sharing some really good stuff that you guys can use um, when you are planning your cross season. And uh, we're doing it now in August so that hopefully you guys can take advantage of a lot of uh, stuff that I'm telling you guys about. So the agenda we'll be covering in the webinar today. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, my background as a coach and athlete. Then we'll sort of break down the main challenges of cyclocross racing and season planning and training. Um, I have been broken down into three sections. And then um, I'll sort of address each one of those um, ways to meet those challenges. Cool. So let's get started. 
and there we go. Okay, so I'm both a coach and a racer, and this is me racing um, the Xilinx Cup in Boulder back when it was still a race. I don't think they have that as a UCI race anymore. But um, so I have one season as a as a UCI cyclocross racer. But uh, when I was 22, I had just finished up school and I finally got the chance to do what I always wanted, which was to be a bike racer. And I had been a runner in college. I had um, sort of committed to you know being a high school runner and a collegiate runner. And I actually had this misconception about cyclocross that it was a whole lot of running. And so I thought, oh, great, I'll just... Uh, you know, I'll just whip up on all these people that haven't been running for the last 10 years, and uh, it'll be great. Well, as a lot of you know, there's not uh, there's not actually that much running across. There's you know, there's a couple minutes per race, a few minutes per race. Um, but I did my first cross race, and you know, it was everything I had hoped it would be. Uh, it was it was totally amazing. Um, so actually, back before back before I was a runner, I was a I was a speed skater, and a short track speed skater, and I used to train um, with Apollo. So I had been doing all these other sports, uh, speed skating and running in college, and but then I you know did my first cross race and ended up crashing in a river and puking, and then I got sick the week later, and so of course I was hooked, and it was, you know, it was perfect from there. Um, so I kind of branched out from from cross into into road, and ended up I was I'm from St. Louis, and ended up racing a lot of criteriums in the Midwest. That's the big thing there is to do there. Um, but I pretty much along the way raced everything from road and track. Uh, where I love the Madison, mountain biking, cross, time trials, um, you name it. And and when I was in St. Louis, there's a lot of, uh, actually a lot of junior riders there. And so I started coaching a lot of those guys, just sort of giving them advice, going on rides with them and stuff. And it turns out that, um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people were asking me for coaching, so I started my my coaching company sort of as a side project, uh, Derek Lattermill Coaching, and I was co coaching uh, a lot of junior cyclists and marathoners. You know, people running their first marathon, uh, junior cyclists racing cross and criteriums and stuff. So I've actually been coaching for about eight years now, and uh, the most recent sort of iteration of that. Um, so where I live in in Bozeman, Montana, when I'm not um, when I'm not in Southeast Asia, uh, the the team I'm on, Rockford Cycling. Actually, it's not a very big town, so there's only a couple of cycling teams. But um, it's actually really cool. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Bozeman. If not, you should probably go. But it's kind of like people say it's like how Boulder was 20 years ago. Um, but there's this great community of ski racers. We have something like 500 kids on this um, ski racing program. And to emulate that ski racing program. And we came up with this after school cyclocross program for kids. And for the last couple of years, I've been running this. This is the flyer, is um, what I've got up here now. This after-school cyclocross program for kids, and um, we've actually had had some of those guys go on to nationals and they race the state championships. And um, so I've been fine-tuning my my coaching through through working with these guys and through working with the uh, MSU team where, where I was actually attending school and so we ended up going to the uh, collegiate cycling nationals and so through these two 
coaching programs, you know, working with the university guys, working with the juniors after school, what I found was that a little bit of planning goes a really long way when it comes to having success throughout the season, a racing season. You know, some of the collegiate cyclists, they decided not to, not to have a coach, uh, and, and they would just sort of go out and ride. And then other ones would, you know, carefully plan their cycling season. And what, what happened was that these guys were upgrading through the ranks really, really fast. They were going to the national championships. And what seemed to be the consistent link between all these guys that were having success is because they knew where they wanted to go and they planned ahead of time. You know, I'm going to try to get a top 10 in nationals or whatever it was that they were going for. And just from having that starting point, it, it was totally clear that um, seeing where the finish line was, so to speak, was exactly what they needed. Um, to, to have that success. So that's that's what I'm going to try to bring to you guys is that sort of sort of overall picture of uh, seeing the finish line and how to how to target that success. Um, also, I wanted to uh, just mention some of these guys that I've uh, I've been interviewing on my. Uh, I Kelly mentioned that I've been writing for Training Peaks, but I've also been interviewing a lot of these pros about how to be a pro cyclocross racer, how to be a pro mountain biker with a lot of the national champions, guys like Jeremy Powers, um, which has really helped get a clear picture of you know exactly what they're doing um, that makes them so good. So I've got a lot of those interviews over on my website and I'll give you that um, address later so you can go check out some of those interviews. Um, okay, but let's get back to talking about cross because this is one topic that I could just uh, go forever about. Like I said, even though I was, you know, muddy and in pain, I was totally hooked and I'm sure you guys all had the same experience if you raced already. And what I, what I think is so cool about cross in the U.S. is that it's different from the way it is in Europe. And in Europe, the way, my understanding the way it was, was these Belgian and, you know, maybe French and Dutch pro riders on the road needed something to stay fit during the off-season, so they, and they, but they didn't want to leave their country, right? Since it's crappy, it's rainy and cold in Belgium in the winter, so that's where cyclocross came. They, they're training year-round, but it's crappy and cold, and they're racing, and you know, it's just the pros, and everyone comes out to watch and drinks beer, and it's awesome, and it's a huge party, but it's like the pros are up on the stage, and everyone else is there watching. And in the U.S., it's totally different because it's it's like a community where not only are we all watching the race, but we're all doing the race at the same time. And, um, you know, the courses in the U.S. are, are supposedly... Uh, a little bit easier, a little bit more friendly. So the beginner, the intermediate, the advanced, the pros, everybody should be able to race on the same course. You know, so you not only are out there spectating, but you get to go out to race. So, it, you know, I love it. And, it. and it's great because I've seen um, sort of, sort of the the whole, you know, participation in the racing just blow up. You know, there's so many more people doing the racing uh, now even than a decade ago when I was when I was first starting out. Um, which I, I want to give a shout out to the way that it's been beneficial for, for women's racing because, you know, I think in Europe the prevailing view is that, you know, the men are the the marquee event, and yeah, we'll also have the women race. But in the U.S., uh, you know, you'll see women's fields, 50, 100 riders, and we're starting to get that equality and openness that that you may not see in Europe. And and we've seen that these women are having great results at the World Championships and the World Cup. So, you know, that's that's awesome and amazing, and I love it. And there's so many there's so many beautiful things about cycling and uh, 
I could go I could go on forever, you know, about how colorful it is or about how, you know, you can follow the racers through the season and, and it's like, you know, following your favorite celebrities on TV or and, and it's free to watch and all these great things. Um and cyclocross really just kind of rolls all those all those things I love about it all into one. So enough about my my love of cross. Um Let's get into the planning aspect of, of a cyclocross season. And uh, I told you I'm going to break it down into three parts. And, uh, and basically what I found uh, is, you know, there's a few sticking points that people are worried about. You know, they're not sure, you know, what they should be focusing on when it comes to cross. Um, so I'm just going to sort of break down what's worked for me and all these other folks that I've been coaching. Uh, throughout the years. So question number one is how do I train for cross? And people are wondering, you know, maybe they're roadies, maybe they're mountain bikers, or maybe they just saw some cyclocross or they, you know, they ride a fixie around and all their friends want to go jump in a cross race. Because cross is open, everyone you have a huge diversity of background of people. Um, you know, people want to know. You know, is it too hard? Oh gosh, it looks painful. Or what if I crash? Because yeah, everyone's going to crash. What should I be doing all summer to get ready for cross? Um, you know, should I be racing road or mountain, or what should I be doing? So we'll talk about setting up, you know, training plans and and what sort of workouts if you know, all that stuff, um, the sort of exercise science behind cross. And then a big part of cross is what equipment do I need? Um, you know, this is actually the fun part, you know, because you get to go out and buy new toys. But cross starts in the summer, you know, September essentially, you got your nice warm Indian summer days. And it goes all the way through to January, so you've got the fall, the rain, eventually the snow, everything's changing. You need some equipment that's your clothing and your bike that's going to get you through all of this stuff. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, tires, shoes, bikes, um, all that stuff. And so the third component we'll go over today is what to do on race day. And uh, people are asking me, you know, like, what uh, what should I be doing for my warm up? Uh, how much should I be eating? And you know, it's a little different than eating during a stage race or on a road race where the races are much longer. So we'll talk about that. Um, you know, the parts of the course that are more challenging. How do I sort of figure out those? When uh, should I arrive for the warm ups? Pits, everything. So we'll go over those three. Um, three topics, and then I'll sort of tell you how to put it all together. And of course, uh, this is Sven Ness, the cannibal from Baal, I think is how you say his town, winning the world championships in Louisville, Kentucky just last year. Amazing race. If you haven't seen it, you can probably find it on YouTube. Uh, and he, he Right, he's 34 years old or 35 years old, and he's been winning for a decade at the top level. He's, you know, he's won hundreds of races. It's not because he's the youngest, fittest rider, not necessarily. And when he was starting out, he certainly wasn't the most experienced racer. Um, as you can tell, I'm, I'm a big fan of his. But he sort of rolls in all this, you know, some tactical skills, the good fitness, the preparation, everything you need, um, pays a lot of attention. You know, that's what Lance Armstrong used to say when he was winning the tours. It was because I pay attention to all the details. But with this guy, uh, it's because he breaks down all the critical little skills and masters each one individually. So that's going to help you guys with today. So skill number one, what workouts to do when during the cross season. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about recovery and things that sort of add and detract uh, from the training. 
So this, like I said, this is, we're going to be sort of getting into the into the physiology. And if you aren't really interested in the science, um, I'll try to be as I'm sort of a science nerd, so I'll try to be as uh, straightforward as possible. But you basically want to work backwards. This begins with the end in mind quotes from uh, Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Um, and so basically you want to start by thinking about what are your goal races, national championships, state championships, maybe there's a series in your hometown that you want to be doing. Um, how long is your season going to be? Are you going to be racing from, I guess, a lot of there's a racing in September now all the way through January, so that's a long season. Or are you, are you just going to make it sort of until the weather turns bad? you got to think about how many races you're willing to drive to, how far you're willing to travel, what that's going to entail. And um, when you're thinking about your final race, you know, the state championships or whatever, uh, that's sort of race that you want to peak for. And so you, so you work backwards from your final race, your peak race, so that you can um, sort of get the best uh, possible peak of fitness right at the time of your goal race so, so you have the best results there. And here's this nice little graph, so really roughly, um, we use this basic formula. Um, you're at uh, so, some base level of fitness, and you add a training stimulus, so a workout. You get tired. It stresses your body out, essentially embarrasses your body. Your body says, oh, we need to recover from that, and we need to be a little bit stronger next time so we're not embarrassed. Your body compensates by gaining fitness um, and then if you if you were to continue resting eventually you would return to that baseline so we're operating with this principle that um, you know you throw something at your body gets embarrassed and it, and it compensates and therefore you gain fitness so we're going to be building fitness throughout the season uh, by throwing different stressors at the body Now, here's an example um, monthly progression that I've just sketched out uh, for you guys. What the sort of big picture of training for cross is going to look like. You may be doing road or mountain bike racing in the summer. You may be doing endurance, um, and you're definitely going to be wanting to do a little bit of speed to sort of build those endurance and speed bases for cross. And um, so, so um, cross is beginning to be its own special sport. You know, you no longer, it's not, no, not any more just for, you know, roadies that want to stay fit or mountain bikers who just want to extend their season. Um, and, and because of that, people are training year round um, so all summer, you know, you get to do these long rides, and that's really important for having um, the nice base you need for longevity to be able to race all the way through the end of cross season. And you may have heard about periodization um, when we're slowly sort of going from, uh, I'm using the word base, and, and essentially when I'm I'm talking about endurance, long miles, uh, and building parts of your physiology that are going to sort of lay the groundwork for you to add things that are more race specific as you get closer to your goal race. So, for example, I'm not saying this is how you have to do it, you might add in running and start working on your cross skills and keep up with your long endurance rides. Maybe you're doing some gravel road rides or mountain biking through August. In September, you start, you know, building some more power. Maybe you start racing. In October, you trend, uh, start to move, working, you know, you're working on uh, thresholds a little bit more consistently, more intensely than you were earlier. In November, you're getting towards a point where you really need to be doing a lot of work uh, around specific race skills, so riding at race pace racing, working on anaerobic endurance. So your total volume of workout is going to be decreasing the intensity 
the race specific speed you're going to be doing is going to be increasing later in the season, November, and then um, probably in December or January, whichever it is for you, you're going to be tapering and hitting that peak of fitness that you've been targeting since the very beginning. Okay, so um, once you have that sort of big picture in mind, you know your season is going to be, I don't know, four months, three months long, you break that down into smaller cycles. Um, I commonly use a four-week cycle uh, where you have three weeks of progressively harder training, whether it's you're increasing the mileage or increasing the intensity of the workouts in, and whether that's adding um, you know, on week one, you're doing four intervals. On week two, you're doing five intervals. Week three, you're doing six you know, or, or reducing the rest. Whichever it is, um, you're going to be progressing, you know, throughout that cycle. And then on the fourth week, you're going to drop back half of the volume, half the intensity, and take a big rest. And that's going to allow you to step up your fitness uh, throughout the, throughout the course of the season without uh, exposing yourself to overtraining or anything like that. So uh, here's an example of a weekly training schedule that you might see mid-season during cross-season. You probably raced on Sunday, maybe you raced Saturday and Sunday, but Monday you're going to want to take off, probably, because you're going to be cooked from the racing. And the racing actually um, can leave you more tired uh, than than your midweek workouts, you know, because you're going all out, you're laying it on the line for for the win or for whatever place it is you're fighting for. So, um, as a quick aside, you'll actually see some of the some of the top riders skip some races late late in the season um, because they can actually gain more fitness by not racing. They can cram, um, you know, a lot of high quality training in uh, when they're not worried about so much recovering after the races. So um, we all know that cross racing can be pretty challenging, and the after effects are felt, you know, probably through Monday uh, and and maybe even Tuesday. So the the golden days. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, that's when you can get in the quality work during the cyclocross season. You're probably going to be want to be doing your harder intervals, race pace intervals um, earlier in the week so you can have time uh, to recover if you're going to be racing in the weekend and, and have a quality race. Um, so you'll probably be doing a set of intervals on um, Tuesday or Wednesday, and also on Tuesday or Wednesday you're going to be doing your practice racing and your technique. And then on Thursday is a great day to do um, sort of endurance maintenance, go on a couple hour uh, endurance ride. Because even though you're going to be doing a lot of racing, um, you still want to be doing enough uh, endurance so that it's like zone one and two, mostly zone two, uh, riding that you maintain um, all those physiology benefits that you work so hard over the summer to get travel. Friday, you know, maybe you got a race in another state you got to get to. So Fridays, uh, I like to reserve for, for some easy riding. Opening, um, doing some riding, just enough to sort of a uh, couple minutes of race pace riding to get your legs ready for the next day. If you're racing on Saturday, um, you go through your normal race routine or you do a little bit longer ride, again, to help maintain some of that endurance you built up. And then Sundays, it seems, are the most popular days to have a race. So this is what a normal week will look like. Um, a, lot of, a lot of pros I talk to, uh, a lot of my athletes follow a similar progression to this. Um, but, but switching you know, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays around, it can be mixed around pretty well um, and get the same results. So I highly advise, and you guys clearly know about training peaks, um, you know, that's how you got on this webinar, but I highly advise keeping all this, um, your training schedule on training peaks and, and recording it um, 
because that's how you get the perspective for the long term, you know, each week how you're recovering from the races, tracking your improvements and, and the testing, um, you know, the numbers that you're getting. It's, it's so important um, to be able to track your improvement. And, and because I'm a scientist, I sort of geek out at, about this stuff. Um, but, you know, there's no, there's no point in recording anything if, if you're not going to use it to change something. Um, but I, but I definitely uh, highly recommend, you know, using training peaks, planning your calendar, and sort of working backwards from the from the season wide perspective all the way down to the daily workout perspective. Now, I know that I can't just uh, just give you every workout you could ever want on here, but uh, I thought I'd share a couple of my favorite cross workouts with you. One of them is is a pretty simple, you know, three by 12 minutes at tempo, but with uh, 10 second attacks every two minutes during the interval. And what this does, sort of you're riding along at a hard intensity and then you do an attack, you know, above threshold, uh, sort of almost a sprint, but then you force your body to recover from that while continuing to ride at tempo. And so, you know, just like in a cyclocross race, um, you, you're going to be going hard the whole time, and then you have all these corners that you have to accelerate out of. You have these short little hills you have to get up and over, and so you have tons and tons of little accelerations um, that you need to be recovering from while still maintaining this really fast speed. So this is a great workout for teaching your body to recover even while you're riding hard. Um, and this other workout is great. Um, it's sort of a set of... Uh, 60 to 90 second intervals. I usually do these on on a cross course, where you start off a race pace and then halfway through, you know, 60 seconds in or 90 seconds in, um, sorry, 30 or 60 seconds in, then you do an attack, um, something like two times your threshold power. So you're riding, um, you know, like you're accelerating out of the corner. <clears throat> so you so you get this like large chunk of time at and above race pace. Um, and then you finish it off with a nice sort of 20 minute session of tempo, uh, usually on, on a course with hot laps. And uh, so these are a couple of my favorite, um, favorite workouts that I do during the, during the cross season. Um, there's, there's so many variations, so many more. Uh, I won't get into it all now, but, um, Feel free to use a couple of those. And I also thought I'd mention my, because I work with all those juniors at the, at the Team Rockford after school cross camp, I thought I'd share my favorite games with you guys. And actually, cross is just a huge excuse to play around. So why not just play some games? Um, we end up doing this almost every week. And that at the end, at the end of our session, we do a bunch of really quick 10, 20 second starts where you, um, sort of all line up, maybe there's like six of you on the line, someone yells go, you sprint around a tree and the finish line is the same as the start line. But you do that, you know, everybody gets to, to do five races or ten races. So if you're doing this each time you're out practicing, it's awesome because you get all this race start experience. Um, we play what I call the four-leaf clover passing game where I set up some cones, kind of like a four-leaf clover, and you have to weave in and out and every rider that you pass, you get a plus one, and everyone that passes you, you get a minus one or a zero. Um, so that's really good because a lot of times in cross, you know, there's some places where you really got to focus to pass. Um, tricky, tricky section. We do this uh, race that I call the downhill off camber slalom, where I set up a bunch of cones and we sort of weave in and out of them. Uh, forcing forcing half of your turns at least to be off camera as you sort of slalom your way down the hill. Um, another great thing we do during warm-ups is the Indian run style follow the leader where the lead rider picks a random course through a park and the last rider has to pass everyone. Um, so sometimes they're passing inside, sometimes they're passing outside. And it's actually, it's actually a ton of fun. Um, 
lastly, we go on a lot of, uh, you know, just take our bikes, our cross bikes on some mountain bike single track. And you really have to focus on lifting your wheels up and over the roots and rocks and obstacles. It makes you a much better, um, much better rider. So this is what I do with a lot of the, uh, the junior riders um, that I'm working with. Another thing that I that I've noticed um, from talking to a lot of these um, top pros is that they um, are always doing some midweek training race. Uh, a lot of times, Wednesday Worlds is is what you call it. That's what we have up in Bozeman. That's what they have down in Boulder. Um, where Training Peaks is, and just getting that midweek sort of uh, training session is is totally huge that these guys are taking um, big advantage of being able to at least get half an hour or 40 minutes of race pace training speed in throughout the, throughout the week. That's the only time they're really getting the full speed barriers um, and, uh, and all that good stuff. Okay, so we're going to move on. Um, I think I may try to speed this up a little bit um, so we don't have uh, take too much of you guys' time. So getting the right equipment, I'll go over bikes, tires, and shoes. Here's what I'm riding right now, which is, uh, is actually a custom mosaic titanium bike. Um, friend of mine grew up with in St. Louis. Uh, he's based in Boulder, and this bike actually ended up winning the best cross bike at the Hanbilt show in hey. 2013. Yep. Hey, Derek, I just want to interrupt you for a second. Um, your slides are no longer advancing, so if you want to, oh. um, in your screen sharing, you may ha you may need to stop screen sharing and then start it again, and that may start things over again. If not, I can control your slides for you. Interesting. Okay. Um, uh, is that a is that a thing that will um, oh. and this toolbar on the side I have to oh yep let me change you to presenter again sorry about that ah okay show my screen there we go there we go cool um, awesome. so you guys can see my uh, stuff now yeah okay so here's uh, here's that mosaic and this is a great um, you know, I just wanted to show this because it shows a lot of what uh, is really people are liking in cross bikes these days. You can see it's got the internal cable routing, a semi deep dish rim, and he's gone with disc brakes. And it looks like I think he's got Altegra spec out on this bike. Um, you're going to have to decide what kind of rims, how deep of a uh, how deep of a rim you're going to want. Usually a little bit of depth is good for shedding the mud and the sand. Um, a lot of people go with like the second tier of components like a, like a SRAM Force or an Altegra because these bikes are just getting a lot of grime in them. Um, you may have to replace the parts. Um, and we'll see how the, the DI2 stuff, the electronic shifting, all that goes uh, this season because I expect to see a lot more of that this year. Um, Ridley is, a, is another top choice used by a lot of the pro teams, a lot of, a lot of folks over in Europe. And um, so you can see this one has cantilever brakes, which is popular. Um, it's got something like a 36-46 front gear ratio with maybe 11-25 in the back. Um, the handlebars you can see are sort of tilted upwards. Um, so there's all kinds of, you know, your normal fit considerations and um, basically the, the frame is going to be a little bit, it's probably a, a one size smaller down than you would get on your standard road bike. Um, and you really just want to test ride these frames, make sure they handle the way you want them to handle uh, or, or just go get a custom one if, if you really want to throw down. But um, most big bike companies are offering full ranges of, beginner to advanced to pro level packages. So um, you can really find awesome cross bikes these days. And I, and I just want to mention specifically how important tires are. This is probably when you ask any pro what 
is the number one thing to upgrade on a cross bike. It's the tires. And what I'm training on is uh, tubeless tires. They're great from, from mountain biking. They work the same way. It's just a rim and a tire and some sealant and really easy to train on. If you get a flat, sometimes they can seal themselves up before it's a problem. Uh, you can change them quickly um, if, if you have changing conditions or, or whatever on a race weekend. But the biggest advantage you can get is investing in a set of tubular tires. And these are going to be the tires that you can run the lowest pressure and they're going to have the best traction. So when you're doing the, the cornering in the mud and the rain and the grass, whatever, you, you really want that low tire pressure so you can grip and get, um, you know, so you're not sliding down, you're not sliding down the hill doing endos and somersaults. Tires are going to keep you, keep you riding when everyone else has to uh, get off their bike and run or slipping and sliding. Actually, Sven Nice has something like 50 different wheel sets with 50 different tire combinations. He's got his own guy out there uh, taking care of everything. And so you know it's important. And if you've ever been to a cross race uh, on the start line, you know everybody's, you know, taking their thumb and pressing in your tires, you know, like, hey, man, what pressure are you running? Like, yeah, what are you going to run today out there? And so it's super important to get the tires and the pressure right. And when it comes to pre-riding the course, I'll talk a little bit about, about the tire pressure. So make sure you get uh, some really good tires. If you're not going to get tubular, at least get tubeless. You can run those a little bit lower than you can a uh, regular puncher. And uh, the shoes are the other thing I want to talk about. Um, you're going to be running in your shoes at least up some hills, you know, through some mud or some sand. So they really need to fit well. They can't slip in the heel, and they need to flex. So the two, my favorite two shoes, um, I heard a lot of good things about the Lake Cyclocross Pacific shoe that just came out last year. Um, you can recognize it everywhere because it's bright orange. And my personal favorite is the CD, and this comes with um, a sole that actually has a little bit of flex to it. And coming from a running background, I don't like those hard carbon plates. Um, you try running and they don't flex at all. You want to you have a little bit of a normal flex. Um, and the CDs are nice because you can replace the buckle, so you get mud or sand in it. You can replace that. You can replace the straps. You can replace the toe. Um, what are they? The toe bolts. You can. It's great. So this is a really good shoe for cross. That's what I, you know, I love it. It's red. It looks great. So the final skill I want to talk about is race specific stuff and what this entails are the pre-writing the course and the warm-up on race day we will go through the various technical skills and components of the cyclocross race and I'll sort of reiterate the theme of conserving momentum uh, what is the fastest overall way for you to go through a cyclocross course uh, we'll talk a bit about traveling, and when I say fuel here, I mean food, um, which is a question I get a lot about cross. So a lot, of, a lot of times these days, you'll be able to find this great course map on the uh, race flyer. You can plan out exactly where you're going to be parking, where your mechanic, if you have one, is going to um, you know, be able to find the, the pit. And this is really great to look at the map, and I tell my athletes they can use this to start pre-visualizing how, um, how the race is going to go. So before they even get to the race, say this is, this is actually the national championship um, from a couple years ago, but they can get an idea in their mind of what the course is going to be like, the twists and turns and the terrain, where the stairs are going to be, if it's going to be, you know, the middle part of the race is going to be the challenging, and then there's going to be a lull where you have a lot of straightaways. Previewing the course map is a really good place to start. And once you get to the course uh, on race day, I recommend arriving at least two hours early um, to give you plenty of time to register and pre-ride the course. And what you're going to do on the pre-ride is do at least two laps easy on the course uh, you might even walk it ahead of time, have your mechanic or friend or parents or fans check it out with you. And you're going to find the toughest section of the course, 
and you're going to ride that part of the course a few more times because you want to improve your weaknesses. We know you can ride fast on a straightaway. How can you do through the chicanes, the sand, the barrier? So you're going to really work on that trickiest part during the warm-ups. Okay. Everyone knows that barriers are a huge part of cross, and it's not just because that's where the hecklers stand and yell at you like these guys are, um, the Ryan Fervone here, but that's probably, besides the run-up, the place where you're going to be getting off the bike and your biggest chance to screw up. And I trust that most of you are going to be more adept at getting off than getting back on. And I'm not going to go into all the technical details of exactly how you should be getting on because it's much easier to watch a YouTube video or see in person. But um, what, I, what I want you to do is think about conserving momentum here, getting back on as smoothly as possible, even if you have to slow down to a walking pace and you know putting your inside thigh on the top of the saddle and sort of walking out of the bike and just naturally progressing back up to speed. Uh, you definitely don't want to be just taking a flying leap and landing on the top of your saddle and squishing your special parts. Uh, I think the first uh, the first good season I had, I did about a thousand sets of double barriers before I ever did any cyclocross specific racing or skills or anything. I just went to the park and did some barrier repeats. And it's sort of like building a base, you know. You've got your endurance base and you've got your skill base. Um, okay, let's talk about the start because the start is the other really important part of the race. And uh, there's this there's this quote. Um, I can't remember who it's from. Maybe it's from an announcer that says, "Cross racing starts like a road race and ends like a boxing match." So what happens is, is if you've ever done a Criterium or seen the Tour de France, everyone's riding together in this peloton. When the gun goes off, there's a huge pack. But at the end of the race, you've got this small group, you're battling one guy for that, you know, final spot on the podium or whatever it is. And, and so the start's super important because if you're going the same speed as some guy throughout the entire race, but you're 20 spots ahead of him, he's never going to catch you. So this is why we train start and practice to start um, with the juniors a lot uh, because it's you know it's really important to get clipped in get as close as you can to the whole shot and maintain your position in the first five minutes of the race okay next um, I'll get a lot of questions about running how much running should be should you be doing for training and as I said uh, earlier you know, I thought, oh, this is going to be great. There's going to be a lot of running. As a runner, I'm going to be so good at cross. But there's pretty little amount of running. So I actually recommend only um, at the beginning of the season doing some running like 20 minutes a day, five days a week, something like that, to get your body used to the running, but, but not running so long. You're not running an hour or, or two like a marathoner, um, that it's going to slow down your explosiveness out of the corners um, which can actually happen. If you do too much running, you actually start to slow down as a cyclist, which is, you know, a little bit counterintuitive, but um, you want to you wanna limit your running. Um, another skill that comes up a lot is uh, off-camber riding, and the best way around this, um, again, besides practicing, is unclipping that uphill foot, and that sort of puts your balance in the right place and it allows you to sort of dab that foot on the ground if you find yourself sliding out. Um, and again, this is where those off-camera drills really come in into play. Um, when dealing with the run-ups and, you know, in this case, maybe the run-downs in the sandy areas, uh, you're not going to gain a ton of places here. If you're a really awesome runner, maybe you can run past some people, but um, Really, you just want to maintain that momentum, be able to get quickly off the bike. You need to be able to decide if you can ride through the first half of the sand pit, but not the second half, exactly how you're going to get off. Um, and this can all be decided sort of on the pre-ride, like where am I going to need to bail out? Uh, maybe it's when you come around a 180 corner or something like that, you can no longer keep your momentum. Um, 
but overall, right, you want to get through the course, through the barriers, through the sand as fast as possible on average. Whether that's running or riding is sort of a decision you make on the fly. And eventually you get, um, you'll have to deal with mud at some point and you'll have to deal with sand at some point. And, you know, besides picking a dry line and um, running through it, you're, you're going to have to, you know, learn to follow the bike where it wants to go and, and just pick the, pick the fastest lines. So this is, this is sort of a skill that I can tell you to practice, but um, I think you're, this is one of those that you're going to have to actually get out there and try for yourself. So I actually take some of my, my junior guys over to the beach and we ride through the sand and you learn to, to follow the, the track of the, of the rider that went before you and it's actually much faster. The wheel cuts down through the previously worn, uh, previously worn track. So, you know, you, you pick up these little, little tricks like, you know, following the line, that sort of thing. Um, and you can keep a lot of, a lot of speed. Another question I get is during the summer, what should I be doing? What's better? If I want to be a good cyclocross rider, should I be doing mountain bike or road? And I'll just use a couple of stories as examples. You know, some of the best cross riders in the U S um, are doing mountain biking a little bit more than they're doing cross. But at the same time, you see these guys doing a handful of road stage races uh, in the summer to get their fitness levels up for cross. And the world champion, um, Zdenek Stibar, is a professional on the road. So what I think you can really get, especially if you're just starting out, is if you want to do some mountain bike racing, it's really going to help your technical skills. You know, like I show here, uh, Stibar doing some bunny hops, bunny hopping the barriers or logs in the course or being able to ride when other people are running is a huge advantage you can get from mountain biking. If you want to do road prep, you're going to come in with this huge base of fitness and then you have to sort of add technical skills in um, on top of your fitness. Okay, one last thing I want to cover is, um, is packing for a race and Say you're driving to a race, not flying. Um, in this case, I want you to, you know, think you're probably going to be doing a lot of local races. Some you might be traveling, um, but there's all kinds of things you need to bring to a race, and I'm going to go over what can prevent you from having a sucky weekend. Uh, so think about what breaks the most: uh, cables and chains what makes you miserable being cold and wet and what makes you race poorly is not being able to have traction and you know not being able to ride when other people are riding so keeping that in mind you're going to want to bring your warm-up clothes separate from your race clothes so that you can warm up in the rain or in the snow and then change into some dry race clothes stay warm Spare chain and tool and spare cables on a muddy day that gums up your drivetrain. These are the cheapest and easiest ways you can get your bike back to working order if you're your own mechanic. Um, I bring toe spikes, spare buckles and cleats for my shoes and pedals because those are the things that are getting really mucked up with mud. Um, plenty of towels to wipe down your legs and the bikes get clean and dry for when you have to go to the podium buckets and brushes for cleaning and uh, you know like galoshes, boots, hats, scarves, um, oops I meant jacket, not a jacket, that's a typo there. Um, what they say is put a hat on as soon as you're not racing um, and in Belgium they wrap a scarf around you as well because uh, there's a saying you know if your throat's cold then you might be getting a cold. You definitely want to, you definitely want to focus on minimizing the risk of getting sick, of getting cold, of uh, not being able to race the second day. If you race on Saturday and your bike gets messed up, you want to be able to fix that. So that's, that's kind of how I think about packing is what's going to hedge against any possible accident. Um, so, and as far as race fuel goes, 
Um, on the road, it's a bit different because you got to be eating all all the time. Um, you know, in a five-hour road race, um, it's a lot different than an hour or forty-five minute cross race. So what I tell people is, this is sort of my progression: uh, eat a big hearty breakfast, plenty of time before the race, three to four hours before the race, oatmeal, yogurt, uh, fruit, whatever it is. Then keep snacking, little bitty snacks, like an energy bar, maybe an hour before the race, so you're most of the way digested through your food when you start, so you don't get the stomach cramps or whatever. And then during my warm-ups, I recommend uh, some sport drinks, and maybe you take a gel or some blocks 10 minutes before the race to top up your, your blood sugar, your glycogen. Um, but you really want to be starting the race without much in your stomach, because afterwards, you're just going to pick out on Belgian beer and frites and chili and whatever it is uh, that you uh, are going to treat yourself to while you're heckling your friends. Super. So um, just to summarize, we talked about the training, breaking the training down into season-long view, then the sort of larger cycles, the month-long progressions, breaking it down into the what you're going to be doing each week, and then a day-by-day -day sort of plan where you're recovering from the races over the weekend and then trying to add some fitness in during the week. Um, equipment, we talked about getting a bike that fits you, getting some tubeless or uh, tubular tires so you can maximize that um, advantage for cornering and stuff like that. And then we talked about the key skills that you're going to need for racing. Uh, so, if you want to put all this stuff into action, what you should go do today is go to your calendar, go to USA Cycling, and pick all of your season races and get them on your calendar. Then work backwards, figure out how many weeks you have until your goal race. Break that down into four-week chunks, uh, if you want to work with that, one-month-long chunks. And plan out your weekly training schedule. Uh, get your equipment, get your bike ordered and in so you can start riding it and testing it. Um, find those Wednesday World training races or get some training partners and get out there and start um, doing some of those drills and, and doing a bit of racing. So real quick, uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, your training peaks and coaching because some of you might be thinking okay, that's a lot of stuff to keep in mind. What if that just sounds like a ton of work and it's too much? Well, here's what you should do. Um, you can go get a training plan from Training Peaks. They have uh, the training uh, plan store where you can go buy a pre-made training plan. Of course, you can also use tra Training Peaks to make your own uh, own calendar. You can design your own workouts. Maybe you are using a book or something. Or you can hire a coach, um, which I highly recommend to anybody because you instantly gain access to all of that coach's knowledge. Um, basically, it short circuits your learning curve and you get to learn really, really fast. So if you want to break through to the next level um, and focus on the racing and the fun parts and leave all the tra um, the training, the planning, everything to a coach, I highly recommend, um, you know, any athlete I think should be having a coach. This is actually why I use a coach even though I am a coach. Um, it provides you some, some great feedback and a lot of outside perspective to what you're working on. Um, if, you, if you're interested in, in coaching with me, I do things like training plans, um, specific diet, specific race strategy, the season planning. Um, we talk a lot about motivation and, and psychology and stuff like that. Um, we talk about equipment. We do preseason gym work, physiological testing, all, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so one of the Rockford junior riders um, that I work with, did both the cycle cross and the mountain biking national championships. And what I really work with him a lot is, is sort of having the confidence to really throw down in a race because he's got this amazing body of training 
that he's put in um, behind him. And uh, another guy that I work with, Zach Heskett, uh, he's actually over in Europe right now um, racing in Belgium, and I helped him quickly go from Cat 4 to Cat 1 um, just by we focused a lot on the strategy and the tactics behind racing and, and race prep so that he could sort of take this big leap. Um, you know, he had the fitness, but what he really needed was the, the tactics and the strategies around racing. Uh, so I'm going to offer you guys, if you guys are interested in coaching uh, for webinar attendees for this cyclocross attendee only, uh, today only, sorry, um, you can get your first month's free coaching with me uh, with the six-month commitment. And what you should do right now is go over to um, DerekLoudermilk.com slash blog slash coaching. And I've got a couple levels of coaching depending on how much um, contact we have each other with each other. And you can get fully customized coaching program from me and I'll go through all this stuff in detail with you, make it much easier um, than trying to go through it all on your own. Uh, you know, you can, you can learn all of this stuff on your own, absolutely. Um, but a coach takes, takes all the headache. Um, just tells you exactly what you need to know. If you want to buy a training plan, you can go to trainingpeaks.com, um, training plan, cycling, cyclocross, and there's several people who have got really awesome training plans up over there. I highly recommend those. You can just use them on Training Peaks um, and sort of coach yourself through the season. And I also wanted to point you guys over to my blog which is called The Art of Adventure, and I've actually just posted this week the 2014 Ultimate Guide to Cyclocross Resources, and that's where I list my favorite training books on cyclocross, all of the websites that I go to um, for cyclocross racing news or training or whatever. So this is like all the resources that I recommend uh, for becoming a better cross racer. Um, and you can sign up for the email updates where I send out uh, training articles and exercise physiology reviews and stuff like that. So at this point, um, Kelly mentioned we had a bunch of questions. So let's um, let's yeah. get into those. Absolutely. So due to um, the time that we're at right now, we'll just go through one question. And then any questions remaining, we will have you address in a blog post. If you guys have any other questions, enter them into that questions box right now to ensure that it gets included in that blog post. So our question that we are focusing on is peaking for mid-season, say November 2nd race, is pretty straightforward. But how do you maintain fitness to complete the season through mid-December at top performance? Basically, what workouts should you do after the peak to maintain the peak or stay close to it? I'm asking because most programs presume that your target race is end of season. Um, yeah, that's that's an interesting having a really long peak or sort of having a, a peak and then and then a month or two in between. And we see this a lot with guys that are targeting the state championship at the end of November and then the national championships in January. And it's a fine balance between recovering uh, from that first peak event and um, you know you don't you definitely don't want to lose fitness and you don't have time to sort of rebuild and do a full base so what you need to do is design workouts that are going to keep um, all the work you've done before all of the all the base work all of the threshold level work and the anaerobic work you want to um, sort of main, do workouts that have enough of those included in them to maintain the levels that you have and then whatever specific weakness you found in that first peak um, whether it was your sort of anaerobic endurance um, the repeated accelerations or whatever that's the thing that you have the opportunity to to focus on on fine-tuning and so so you, you carry through 
all of your all of your basic physiology skills that you've acquired, um, your fitness that you've acquired, you do one workout a week to maintain your endurance, one threshold workout a week to attempt to maintain that. And then you, as much as you can, focus on sharpening the thing that's holding you back. Um, maybe you have a three-month, uh, sorry, a three-week progression where you work on that skill uh, and then it's time to sort of taper again and hit your second peak six weeks later or something like that. Great, thank you. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you everyone for attending the webinar. Again, we have recorded the webinar and we'll be posting it in a couple business days if you would like to watch it again. If you'd like the slides, please contact our help center. Our customer success team will get you those slides as soon as possible. Thanks again for attending, everyone, and thank you, Derek. Thanks, guys. It was a pleasure.